All right, good afternoon. My name is Steve Duran with Jefferson County. I'm the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee, and I call to order the April 25th, 2022 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. I just got to say, it's wonderful to see everybody in person for the first time in some cases in two years, maybe more. So, welcome to a live meeting. Uh, this is actually a hybrid meeting. We do have Zoom uh, uh, participation by some members of the public. So, uh, th this is a hybrid meeting of the public. Uh, attending by Zoom, I have the ability to mute and unmute themselves, I presume, um, and share the webcam. Uh, we ask that those attending speak, uh, attending to speak, use the raise hand button and ask questions and comments on the agenda. If you're live, obviously, you can live, or raise your live hand. Uh, please make sure that you type your name and it reflects uh, first and last name and your uh, organization that you represent. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature if you're coming in by Zoom. So with that, uh, we'll do roll call. Um, do we want to start with folks here in person? Yes. We thought since uh, many of us may not know each other, since some of you may be new, we'd go around and actually introduce yourself in person here. So why don't we start kind of over here? Justin, do you want to go first? I think you're the Look, first. My sure. Uh, <laughs> Justin Schmitz uh, with uh, City of Lone Tree. Uh, Director of Public Works for the city. Bill Soroy, uh, Senior Manager of Transit Oriented Communities at RTP. Chris Godhan, uh, Multimodal Planning Branch Manager for CDOT. I am the alternate to Rebecca White, who is the Director of the Division of Transportation. Jessica Mickelbus, the Regional Transportation Director for CDOT Region 1. Great to see everyone. Brooke Svoboda, uh, Director of Planning and Development for the City of Ron Papsdorf, Transportation uh, Planning and Operations Director at Dr. Cog. Jacob Rieger, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. And Jeff Bank, Current Public Works Director for the City of Centennial. Kip Morgan, Regional Transportation Engineer for the City of Thornton. Deborah Baskin, City of Westminster, but Jefferson County, uh, one of our two representatives today. Um, I am the Senior Transportation Mobility Planner for Westminster. Hello, Sarah Grant, City of County of Broomfield, and the Transportation Manager. Oh, is that right? Personal Transportation Planner of Boulder County. Hi, Carson Priest, Executive Director of Smart Community Metro North. I represent the TDM Not Motorized Chair. I'm Chris Bolton, Director of the Planning Event. Everyone, I'm up to the April date of Brian Weimer, Public Works Director of Rathville County. Chris Hudson, Deputy Director of Town Parker. Uh, and uh, I'm Cam Kennedy with Dr. Cog, and it looks like we have a couple of people joining us remotely. Uh, Eugene Howard, city, uh, city and County of Denver, and then Kevin Ash, uh, the Town of Frederick. Okay. Um, should we, we, got, we have uh, new members, uh, Jacobs? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. One new membership update. Um, city and County of Denver, Justin Bagley, who I don't think is here today. Um, he has been an alternate. He is the new member of the city county of Denver. So uh, welcome to Justin. Okay. This roll call. Oh, oh go ahead. Make sure that city and county of Denver is represented here. David Gaffer. David. Okay. Uh, next up, we are uh, into public comments, I believe. Um, We'll now open the meeting to public comment. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. Uh, if you've joined us by phone, I don't know if anyone is possible to join us by phone, uh, please use your raise hand virtual, raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine. We will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and you'll need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up uh, and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after the public um, comment period, only TAC members and alternates will participate in discussion regarding each agenda item. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll give it a second to see if anyone has their hands raised. I don't see any remotely, and I don't see any in person. Uh, so I don't believe we have any hands raised for public comment, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Next, we will uh, 
discuss the March 28th, 2022 tech meeting summary. If there is any discussion, correction, or questions about the March 28th, 2022 tech meeting summary. All right. We will. Oh, go ahead. Just a real brief announcement, real quick. A couple things. Um, for those people in the room, Wi Fi credential information is written on the whiteboard at the front of the room. For people that haven't been to the building before, restrooms are out these doors to the hallway. Hang a right, go all the way to the end of the hallway. That's where restrooms are located. There's also some coffee and some refreshments out in the hallway for folks if you haven't found your way there yet. Okay. All right, well, let's move on to our one and only action item on the agenda this month, and that is the TIP regional call recommendations. Todd Cottrell, you're up. All right, thank you, everyone. And as being the first staff member to say this, Todd, we actually are not going to use the mics. We're hoping that oh, they, okay. it, this is a brand new tech, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Brand new technology <laughs> endeavor. So we're going to see how well this works. Yeah, I guess it's worth mentioning there are cameras on these too, right? So they will, it should pick you up as you speak, if I'm not mistaken. I'm sure as we go along, this is going to be a lot smoother. Smooth as butter. <laughs> this works smoother earlier. I'm just going to let you know. Sorry, everyone. All right, I think we're I think we're good. Sorry. It was not there before, so all right, so this is weird. Um, and sorry for all the technology goofs. I'm sure as we go through today, it's gonna be like that. But uh, thank you for attending. Uh, the first action item today is to talk about the recommendation out of call one. So just a little bit of background, if I can tap there. All right, so uh, just as a reminder, we are at uh, the end or nearing the end of the regional call number one to program 
a million dollars. This is out of a, a total of four calls for $463 million. So a little bit of details about this call. Uh, it opened on January 24th for a total of eight weeks and closed on March 18th. And again, this was for air quality and multimodal applications only. Uh, so in the end, the applications uh, put forth must improve air quality and or congestion. Um, in accordance to TIP policy, each forum was allowed to submit up to three applications with CDOT and RTD allowed to submit up to two each. And again, 40, $40 million, $323,000. And you can see the funding breakdown here at the bottom of your screen. There was a total of 13 applications that were received. Um, as outlined here on the on the screen, and this is also uh, located on our website. Of those 13 applications, all were eligible. Um, so after Dr. Cog posted these applications to our website, check for that eligibility. A dozen Dr. Cog staff scored them. Um, in the end, um, those uh, one weighted average score for each application was developed. Um, as a reminder for the scoring process, that is on a score of zero to five. Um, approximately during that same time, there was also a public comment period um, that staff opened from March 23rd to April 6th. Um, the public was allowed to comment on a web map uh, for each available project. They were also allowed to either uh, support the project, um, issue, list if they had concerns or if they were opposed to that project. A total of 246 comments were received during that time. It, also in accordance to the, uh, the TIP policy, a project review panel was formed, and they met twice on the, uh, April 11th and April 14th. Uh, they deliberated over these projects for a total of approximately eight, eight hours. Um, the panel received the scores and the public comments and ultimately were to develop uh, a recommendation. That recommendation is as you see on the screen, uh, again, totaling 40 million, 323,000. Um, overall, again, Dr. Cox staff was not a panel member, um, but I will speak for those panel members that their recommendation was um, based on quality, high, highly scored projects from around the region um, with a goal of, you know, for, to provide less funding, but to more projects in order to find a larger, diverse set of types and locations. There is a couple things that I would like to point out um, that you won't necessarily see in your screen, but Again, within your packet, there's a little bit more detailed uh, spreadsheet containing the information um, on the recommendation. Uh, so the first is the submittal by Broomfield. Um, this is the State Highway 7 corridor multimodal improvements. Um, from a staff perspective, we're not, we don't believe that there's necessarily a change, but just a clarification um, in terms of what is written on the spreadsheet and the panel's recommendation. Um, so on the spreadsheet, there is a, um, an actual cell called smaller allocation. This is taken directly from the application itself. And it's a, a question that the sponsors are asked um, when they're applying is if a smaller allocation was awarded, what elements of your project could you, um, you know, could you actually um, complete and, and, and what projects elements you might have to remove, et cetera. In addition to that, there's also a column called the panel recommendation notes. Um, and this was taken from the conversations with the project review panel. Um, so the smaller allocation cell, again, it's not necessarily part of the panel recommendation. It came directly from the allocation or from the, the, the application itself. Um, but I would like to point out that the panel recommendation notes are correct. And that states minimal, minimum amount indicated by sponsor to fund elements in all three subregions. Uh, so for this project and further discussions with the sponsor, um, they would be able to design all six locations, um, four of them at 90% and two of them at 30%. Um, the second comment is regarding the first project in the list, the State Highway um, 119 BRT safety and mobility improvements um, submitted by Boulder County. Um, there is a correction that staff would like to make. Um, so in that spreadsheet, in that panel recommendation notes, uh, it also says the same statement as the one before, minimum amount indicated by sponsor to fund all sub-region submitted elements. Um, that is not correct. So 
within the recommendation of the 11 million to um, 240,000 um, that recommendation would include the removal of the J road underpass. So those are the two uh, changes or corrections I would like to point out. Um, so when you get ready to make a motion that is presented here on your screen, but I just wanted to kind of summarize up what those next steps are. Um, one week from now on May 2nd, call number two will open. In late September, uh, we will take the recommendation um, that is made by the board next month for call one and the recommendation that is made out of call two. We will then add those to the current 22 to 25 tip. Um, at that time in September, the award notification letters or emails will be sent, and then you can begin your IGA process if, if you are successful for funding. So with that, be happy to take any questions or comments you may have. All right, do you have any questions? Go ahead. Right. So my question, I have two questions. First question is, what did you learn as staff reviewing these? terms of scoring, since this is new scoring for this tip go around. And second, did the scoring and weighting adequately create a differentiation between projects to make determinations? To answer your second question, um, as again, compared to four years ago when the scoring system was basically zero to three, now it is zero to five. Um, we did find that there was a um, a, a higher level of range so that was that was very helpful and again i think from a panel perspective um, score is not the only thing that can take it into consideration so very similar to our old system where you know maybe a 75 and a 74.9 there was no distinction between a project i think the same thing translates over to the scoring system where at a 3.6 and a 3.5 there's not much difference in terms of the score um, things that we have learned maybe as staff scoring them, um, I don't think, truthfully, again, I'm just one of a dozen, there was much difference from last time. Of course, every score is going to have a different interpretation of a question. Um, they might have a different methodology. Um, so, for example, somebody might think going in that every answer is a three, and then they might add or subtract from that, or some score might think that every answer should be scored a five and then based on the answer they would go down from there so having multiple scores look at the same question i i think is very valuable any other questions go ahead justin yeah i think this was certainly a, a good process and i think we all learned through it like you said Tata. i think one question that we have and it certainly is you know, as we try to distribute that, you know, that funding evenly around that all the different region, you know, kind of what was some of the assumptions that went in, because obviously it kind of varies, right, on how much reduction um, each of the projects were recommended for. So I guess just a little bit of help in understanding what that process was and, and especially how some of the higher projects may have had more reduction than others. Right. So I would actually invite maybe if a member of the panel would like to try to answer that. panel members do we have here? Do you want to go ahead? Uh, sure. So, Alex Edward, uh, Board County. Um, and looking at a couple other my fellow panelists here, uh, I think we had at least three things that we waited. Um, one was generally trying to award the higher scoring projects a higher percentage of the funding that they had requested. Um, a second one was trying to fund at least a project in each of the forums that submitted a project. And I think we were successful in that regard. This is all forums submitted projects in this round. And then um, a third was looking at the minimum funding amounts that um, applicants put in their project applications. Um, so those vary in terms of what minimum amount folks said they could accept in order to still move forward with the project. I think those were probably the big three that we made when the other questions? I was just going to chime in with a little bit more perspective from the panel that it's always challenging to want to fund as many projects or the best projects, and we certainly tried hard to do that 
Um, what was interesting was having some new players in the room, which I really appreciated. So Rachel Maltin with Bicycle Colorado was there, and she kept asking, what makes it a regional project? We still don't have an answer, but I was trying to make the point that like, it's like the big, hairy, audacious thing. Like, it's, it's the thing, you know, we want to fund these things. So um, we thought about that. And then the other thing that we thought about as a panel is that many of these projects can go back to the sub-regional forums and subsequent TIP calls to seek money. So the ones that we're not talking about on the screen all have opportunities to, to try again and learn from this application process how they could um, put together a little bit better application or a different application and, and take another try at this. Thanks, Deborah. All right, any other questions? Um, another question I thought of is you did a public process. How did that play into decision making, if at all? Panel members, your thoughts? I read every comment that was submitted. <laughs> I recognized a lot of names or recognized that there were people that served in different advisory capacities, such as the, uh, I think the RTD, CAC, and some advisory committee. Some of those folks, they have um, made, taken the time to make comments. So I was, I was looking for patterning and it was interesting to me because I know most of these projects. I know them because I've been involved with them over a decade in some way, shape, or form. So I was interested to see comments in some cases from new players, which is wonderful. Thank you for getting involved with any of you are listening. Thank you for making comments so we weren't out there just guessing what the public might think. But it was it, it, it influenced me to see those comments written down and be able to it's a great job by Dr. Cox staff to give us a very complete packet with everything everybody has said. Any other thoughts on that? Right. So I'll just add on to that and just remind everyone here that we we changed the the public engagement process for this tip cycle from the last from the last tip cycle. So it's tip uh, historically, once we've sort of gone through the process uh, and have a recommendation for awarding for awarding funding to tip projects, then we release the package out for public comment and. You might imagine that the chances to sort of modify that recommendation after a bunch of people have voted on the recommendation is more challenging. So we very intentionally put all of the applications out and soft public comment before the projects were even scored uh, from the technical standpoint from Dr. Cog's staff. So while, while I wasn't a member of the panel, I was one of the staff that scored the projects against the technical criteria. I reviewed all of those public comments as well. And so I was looking for patterns of where there was broad support or from a readiness standpoint, thinking about, you know, are there projects where there might be significant opposition that might hold up a project or hinder a sponsor's ability to actually deliver that, deliver that project. So I think from my perspective, at least, it's a huge improvement and advancement in our process to seek that public feedback and comment before projects are scored and definitely before there's any sort of recommendation or action on a recommendation. Any other questions or comments? Go ahead, Alex. I just wanted to thank Ron for that change in the process. I think for all the reasons you described, that's the, the right step in the process to Okay, I'm not seeing any other hands. So uh, do we uh, have a motion to entertain? Oh, I'm sorry, Brian, go ahead. I'll uh, move to recommend to the RTC Regional Transportation Committee that regional projects as presented today uh, be included in the FY22-25 tip with the regional share of them. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 And all those opposed signify by saying no. The motion carries. So now that is our one action item on the agenda today. Uh, our next informational item is the Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Strategic Plan. Greg McKinnon will do this presentation. 
I will actually start it off. I'm already tag teaming this. So I am uh, Steve Cook, uh, manager of mobility analytics and operations section of Dr. Cog. So I'll kick things off here and then turn it over to Greg uh, in a couple of minutes. It's good so far. Slowly learn. Thank you. Uh, okay, so this is we're going to talk about uh, the regional transportation operations and technology strategic plan. And what this emanates from is we just talked about the TIP, the Transportation Improvement Program. And within that TIP, there's actually a set aside program that's called the Regional Transportation and Operations and Technology uh, Set Aside Program. It's five million, five million a year. And prior to doing a call for projects in a year, in a year or so, um, we're developing a strategic plan to help guide of that process. There How many Dr. Cox staff does it take to turn on a car today? <laughs> <laughs> you can change the light. <laughs> How do we work? Sorry, I don't know. How do we <laughs> All right. Okay. So with that little glitch, we'll move on. So First part, I want to introduce just you know, you know, what is uh, the RTONT program and really looking at those four words and getting that ingrained uh, in, our, in our minds is that you know, the R is for regional. We're talking about regional operations, it's multiple agencies, it's state agencies, regional agencies, local jurisdictions, private companies, um, it's the customers, you know, the users of our transportation systems. It's all that whole regional perspective that we really want to look at in this. The T part of it, but transportation might seem obvious, but it's it's both facilities, roadways, the buses, the physical uh, infrastructure, and the, and the services. So it's the services that RTD offers the public, the services that micro mobility uh, scooter companies are offering, Uber, Lyft. All of that is part of the daily operations. Which takes us down to the O for operations is you know, two of the you know, key distinguishing components among many is that there's the day-to-day real-time stuff. So that's what you know some of your uh, communities, your de your departments, or if it's RTD, you got dispatchers, you got bus drivers, train operators, snowplow drivers for CDOT and local governments. All of that is day-to-day real-time stuff of literally thousands of people out there that are working on this every day um, to make the transportation system operate um, as efficiently and safely as possible. And the second aspect of the operations you know, is the performance analytics. It's kind of the after the fact stuff. You get some data in, and you may realize, well, something wasn't working right uh, yesterday, or this traffic signal timing plan didn't seem to be working right. Or you'll have certain uh, types of technologies that can pick out things that are incorrect on um, so potentially a, a traffic signal uh, device. And then the technology aspect, um, you know, that's things that are with us today, you know, established technologies that we have in transit or tra uh, traffic signals, you know, many things, variable message signs, but it's also the emerging things, you know, things that we really have to keep a pulse on, you know, what's the new thing out there Without keeping 
too much of a pulse on just getting the shiny new toy. You know, if we hear of a new technology or a vendor comes to us, we really have to look at how that emerging, emerging technology truly will help us in our day-to-day -day operations and the functionality of all those things. Um, a little bit of the why we have the uh, RT, o &T set aside program. You know, it's a lot of different things. We've talked about some of the new technologies that we're monitoring uh, with uh, con connected vehicles. You know, any of you with a relatively newer vehicle has all kinds of alert systems on there that hopefully is making uh, some aspects of driving uh, safer. The uh, RTD buses with uh, automated vehicle location technologies, uh, very useful to RTD, but it's use useful to all of us consumers you know, when we get onto our transit app that we can tell, okay, that bus or that train is arriving in two minutes, so I better hoof it over there and, and get there. Um, that's, that, that's a key. Incident management, very, very important on any of these technology uh, aspects. It's having that situational awareness. You know, that's a term you'll hear a lot in our operation world. We, we want to know what's going on out there. We want all the regional agencies and local agencies communicating with each other, you know, letting you know right away, oh, a crash occurred here on US 36. We better tell Broomfield about it. So they, they, they might adjust some you know, traffic signal uh, system uh, timings or notify their public through their uh, channels. So all of that is uh, very, very important. And then, of course, different routing things that we have on our phone every day. You know, that's using information from your agencies, from CDOT, from RTD. So all of that is just, just so, so, so uh, important. Because, you know, in a, in a day, in a typical day, you know, it's a sort of pre-COVID typical day, we'll see what the new normal typical day is, you know, ho hopefully a year from now, we'll be back to that. But we've got 15 million trips every single day that are made by people, you know, the person trips. And about 13 million of these are within motor vehicles, either a driver or a passenger. About 2 million are you know, pedestrian bicycle trips. Of those 13 million, that makes up 10 million vehicle trips. So it's not just passenger vehicles, household vehicles, it's trucks, commercial vehicles, shuttle vehicles at DIA, it's many different uh, aspects to those vehicle trips. And we travel uh, in those vehicles about uh, 86 million miles per day. I do the math on that backwards, I think it works out to be like 400 oil tanker trucks of fuel a day, which is what we really want to reduce in the future. Um, there's congestion delay out there. You know, and the primary concern with this is the stop and go. It's not that we want necessarily traffic to move faster. We want there to be less stop and go, less idling. And then, of course, the most critical thing that we deal with on, on a daily basis is, you know, up to 200 crashes per day scattered throughout the region, you know, six fatalities or serious injuries that occur you know, nearly every day. So how do we respond to those incidents? And how do we try to improve uh, situations for the future so we don't have uh, this many of those? And one number I didn't have up here is that we got RTD providing about 260, 280,000 trips per day to, to people uh, pre-COVID. And hopefully that'll get back up to pre-COVID levels in a, in a couple of years. Uh, my last slide here before I turn it over to Greg is one thing we look at, and I see the title is uh, off there. The, the title there, just about FYI, is a background on the current foundation for the region as we go into this strategic plan for technology and operations. There's about 4,000 signalized intersections out there, and nearly 90% of them are interconnected. And that's something we've worked on through Dr. Cog for the last 25, 30 years to bring that level up. I think when, this, when we started the traffic signal program at Dr. Cog, I don't know, it might have been 20%, 10, 2. <laughs> it was hard to even characterize. <laughs> um, but now, you know, so we got that in place. That was a real key thing, is getting those system connections in place. Um, we got over 100,000 uh, bus and rail service miles that are provided every day 
uh, by RTD. It might be a little bit less right now, but we'll hopefully get that back up uh, in, in a few years. Uh, we already mentioned the uh, AVL devices on you know over a thousand RTD vehicles. Uh, CCTV, the closed circuit uh, TV cameras all around the area, you know, different operators have, whether it's cities or CDOT, RTD, uh, hundreds of miles of fiber optic ne networking, one of the real key backbone foundational elements. And I think right now we're at about 80 intersections that have some type of, or under construction, some type of bicycle detection, which is a very important uh, aspect. And, Another uh, important one that uh, we're implementing more is a transit signal priority at many locations. I forget how many there are right now. So this is just some kind of background on this RTO and T strategic plan. And we'll let Greg go into a little more detail on what's going to be coming up in the next year on this or next few months traditionally. Thank you, Steve. Right, we, uh, we're here to talk about this, the RTOT strategic plan, and uh, here is a uh, uh, quick uh, milestones of what we're looking to do. Uh, just giving you a heads up on it now, but we'll be coming back for action uh, coming this summer uh, to complete the plan. The reason uh, why we're doing that is so that we're prepared to uh, prepare the uh, evaluation uh, procedures and application process for the uh, call for projects for the RTMT set aside that will be next uh, beginning of next year. So the, the plan itself is identifying the near term uh, deployment initiatives uh, and, uh, and uh, being able then to highlight that these are the targets that we're shooting for for the, the call for projects uh, and uh, will inform the selection process. Currently, we have identified about $16 million uh, for the four year uh, period. Uh, for capital projects, but that that will change as we get closer to the selection date. This is a quick uh, diagram of what we've been doing with the, the strategic plan, uh, beginning with the, uh, the Metro Vision and uh, the guidance from uh, the Willy uh, Choice Blueprint. Uh, de developed uh, visions and goals and some objectives. Uh, working primarily with the RTO working group, the Regional Transportation Operations Working Group, which is comprised of uh, operations and technical staff uh, from uh, the jurisdiction. Um, we have uh, presented it to AMP and got some feedback, and now today we're uh, presenting to TAC for some uh, feedback as well. The, uh, we're currently working on de uh, development of the operational concept, which is a, a high level description of the roles and roles responsibilities of the, the partners uh, as they relate to system operations and coordination. And we've broken that, and you'll see in a minute, uh, broken that up into transportation service areas, which are a bunch of uh, overlapping uh, service areas, but it makes the, the uh, conversation a little bit easier to focus down uh, on those. But it also relates to the regional ITS architecture. I'll just make a brief mention of it because it's a uh, federally required uh, description of our um, essentially the operational concept that we're just, uh, describing here. And then this will all lead to a number of regional initiatives uh, that basically you're going to be filling the holes that we see in the operational concept that aren't currently provided. And we're just saying, well, then these are the, these are the uh, initiatives that we want to focus on and be able to prioritize them. That then leads into the call for projects. I have a couple slides here with the, the vision. I won't read through the vision. I'm sure you read it in the packet. Just wanted to highlight that uh, interconnected and collaborative are uh, key words in there that uh, we uh, keep mentioning as, as we keep going forward. Uh, five goals um, were identified. Safe operations, efficient and seamless travel, a trip travel time reliability, uh, so that means making sure that uh, from day to day you have a, the, the travel times meeting your expectations. Uh, you're not surprised by that, uh, that today is the day that it's down two hours longer than it used to be. Um, equitable access to the transportation system and environmental sustainability. So in the discussions, 
we uh, came to these uh, objectives, uh, which relate to the performance measures that we're expecting to uh, track, and then relate to the the, the, the goals that uh, the previous slide, and uh, make sure that we're achieving our vision. Uh, so just going through the, the elements here, you know, we want to increase the trip travel time reliability for all travelers. It's, it's a goal and it's a, an objective. We want to minimize uh, traveler delay due to, to signal operations. And that's referring to all travelers, the transit travelers, uh, 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 bicycles and pedestrians, and, and the vehicles at the intersections. Uh, maximize the uh, infrastructure reliability and, avail uh, and availability. That basically means making sure the system is working right uh, so that we can do the job that, that needs to be done. Improving transit operations performance, um, improve uh, the safety and reduce crashes, fatalities, and injuries. And related to those are specific elements that we're, we're focusing on uh, reduce the average incident duration and disruption, um, and reduce the occurrence of secondary incidents. Those two are strongly related from uh, studies in the past that show that the longer the, there's a disruption in the roadway, the greater chance there's going to be another incident. And then we have another thing to deal with on the roadway. Um, we want to uh, reduce the emergency responder uh, and roadway workers struck by incidents. So this is a new uh, development coming out of the CDOT TIM uh, program, and we want to make sure that we're tracking that as well. This, the struck by is can be people uh, or the vehicles uh, in in work zones or during a stop uh, or uh, whatever enforcement might be going on. Uh, we want to keep track of those things and reduce them, and uh, that that that's one of the, the big goals that uh, the the CDOT TIM program has uh, identified recently. And then the uh, one of the genesis uh, items improve air quality and re reduce uh, transportation related emissions uh, that uh, you know was the uh, when i say the genesis the traffic signal system improvement program from many decades ago that evolved into this uh with, with that that was one of its primary uh, objectives there so i'll take a a short break here and look to see if there's any feedback on the objectives or goals uh, or maybe the vision that you want to share at this point um, and feeding into our process as we keep going on. Any thoughts? Hey, Ken. So, Craig, please, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with any of these. So, if you set some limits of, do you have a baseline for each one of these to look at and what percentage or what number you're trying to get out of that? Um, no. For, for example, RTD, I think you have a 90 or 92% reliability on your trains. That last 6% is still a lot of, a lot of trips that can be missed or, or late. I just was curious what, what type of, of, if you guys had anything in mind yet, or this was just to get this to get started. From, from these discussions, it's it's been conceptual, but you're making a very good point that we need to take the, the targets that we have established uh, regionally and, and make sure they're embodied in here uh, as we move forward. So we're not looking to change, you know, we're, we're looking to build uh, from what we, we've already established in terms of targets, based on that. So will, will this uh, have in it then the targets outlined in the strategic plan with, with this program so to outline those targets. We we will include those numbers in in the document, yes. Yes, if you have something to add? Yeah, just to add to that, just you know, as part of our federally required performance-based planning process, as part of our Metro Vision planning process here at Dr. Cog, and some other things we do, we do have a plethora of performance measures, which do touch on several of the themes and the topics that um, Greg is presenting: safety, travel time, reliability. You know, there's several others. So there are things that we're doing that um, Greg, I think you probably could use, and do touch on the things that um, that Greg's team is looking at. So. And that's that's something that you know uh, to point out about this process. You know there are things. Uh, well, the, the second bullet in particular 
our program has been focused on, on that for some time and we have a way of directly measuring it uh, where other things we are contributing as a part of the whole and so when we are looking at like uh, jacob was saying for for the uh, forms, uh boarding at, at a regional level uh, we are part of that uh, but you know, we are not the the whole uh, the whole cause we're, we're just part of the contribution to to the whole Um, have you determined who is on the, the working group? Is it just Dr. Cobb folks or I guess some of the objectives kind of tie into a lot of things that probably multiple partners work on or manage or control. So how, I'm just curious how you're forming your, your RMT or collecting kind of that data input. Uh, okay, so the, the working group that that, as I mentioned, the Regional Transportation Operations Working Group is an informal group uh, that collaborate with us of the, you know, their the engineers, operators, technicians uh, from the local jurisdictions, uh, RTD, CDOT, uh, all in, uh, you know, focused on the, the operations aspects. Uh, so as we, you know, I think you make a good point and you kind of see some of the stuff that we're moving towards is to be able to monitor this performance, we continue to need to work together on a daily basis to be able to report on those things. And that no has not been uh, taken any further than the conceptual uh, stuff that I'm presenting here today. Frank, can you can you tell us who the CDOT representative is on the RTO and he works there? Yeah, we, there, there's several. We have uh, region one, uh, the uh, uh, the traffic operations, so Ben Keeney and Chris Kirka are, are involved there. Uh, Elzar, um, we at uh, at uh, headquarters, the CETA ITS group, uh, Ali Axley, uh, Bob Pfeiffer, uh, some of the data technical folks from CDO uh, are involved. Um, actually, if you looked at my list, it would be pretty close to about 20% 20, 20 of the people on the list are CEDAW, uh, and they will participate on and off depending on our agenda at any given time. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, wondering what's under the umbrella of transit operations performance. Is that mostly about kind of the, the on-time pieces or are you looking at accessibility from a physical ability standpoint or um, I, I just want to understand performance in a more seamless way. Yeah, it, it is the operations performance and harking back to what Steve, when he introduced it, it's the day-to-day -day operations. We're working with the infrastructure we're given and trying to use it as, as uh, safe and optimal as possible. So yes, there will be changes uh, by other efforts to improve things like you're saying in terms of accessibility, stuff like that. But from an operations perspective, we are not affecting that change. We are best utilizing it when it gets implemented. Right. And when I say we, I mean the royal we. I'm uh, <laughs> pleased. <to be. laughs> Brian, go ahead. So this may be an outcome, but I'm going to phrase it as an objective. And that is a lot of the information that you're collecting here is for what? Improved decision making of the user. So should that be identified someplace as? Hey, we're going to try to utilize this information, get it out in real time or project it for helping the user decide when they're going to make a trip and what trip they're going to make. I hear what you're saying, and I think that we're heading to answer those questions in the, the subsequent slides. You're talking about the users, and I would also say that the operators uh, are going to benefit from from these same things, you know, to understand what is going on to better provide the service to the users. So both of those together. But um, I, I made note of it, and then when we, you know, get to the slides where I'll, I'll highlight again and bring it to your attention, and see if that's addressing uh, what you're looking for. Um, are these in any order of priority, or just as as a collection equally weighted? Just wondering what if there's any. It's, it's the list of, of objectives. 
uh, the um, safety is always number one. Uh, and uh, you know, we have a safety uh, item listed there and some that are measuring safety itself, but some of the other objectives that we're if you're achieving those, you're also contributing to safety. So uh, it's a hard question to answer uh, other than that, that you know, safety is number one. I guess another question for the plan is how how do you think about it when some of these objectives are in conflict? So, you know, one thinking of safety and minimizing travel or delay, you get a projected left turn phasing that's generally safer, but it also slows down traffic operations. Um, and then minimizing traffic delay and then improving air quality if you make it easier and faster to drive in a corridor, apparently you get more trips. So how, how does the plan think about when the objectives are in conflict with each other? Oh, I wouldn't say that they're actually in conflict with each other. There's an apparent conflict. What you're saying is like the outcomes uh, can, can be conflicting, but uh, we are, are looking to uh, balance the operations to ensure that you know both safety is primary thing. If there's a safety problem here that that uh, needs the uh, additional attention, like you were describing in terms of uh, you know protective left turns, then that's what gets employed uh, and it's done. Uh, with, uh, the safety element is dealt with, and then efficiency is built off of that. It's uh, the safety won't succumb to uh, efficiency improvements alone, but we make sure that we uh, address all of that so that we're we're comfortable that we're providing safe and efficient travel. All right, I will move on. Thank you for your input. So I mentioned earlier the transportation service areas. We broke them down into these 10. And this graphic is kind of show you what we're dealing with. You know, the travel information and tra uh, traffic incident management are, are key things uh, for, for uh, being able to do the operations from uh, the, the regional standpoint. Uh, you see that we're work, working with uh, freeways and arterials, and we have maintenance and construction, which is good in keeping the uh, the infrastructure in good condition, but it also impacts on our travel time reliability. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight is that the data management uh, you know, to achieve the, the goals and objectives that you've identified and, and you know follow the guidance of uh, documentation like the mobility choice blueprint. Uh, it's got to be built on a foundation of data management, data sharing, uh, and access to the data that's, uh, that, that we uh, need to be able to both operate and uh, provide the information to the travelers. So that's why I wanted to show, you know, this is the, the, the foundation that we're, we're uh, have identified and that we're, we're building from. And I, I think, Brian, this is addressing your question in particular. So uh, we, we want to be able to collect the data and share it uh, in between these uh, new platforms, something that, that doesn't exist yet. We, uh, we need to be able to achieve the, the goals and objectives that we're talking about. The first, the situational awareness platform. That's a, essentially having a, a real-time uh, picture of what's going on in the region with a focus on disruptions. So where, where is there a transit disruption? Where is there uh, a crash? Where is there a work zone that's gonna be uh, disrupting the normal function of the day? And so that information then can be used by both the operators and uh, emergency staff to uh, take action and, uh, and uh, work at providing uh, safe and efficient operations. The, the traveler information side of it is uh, another element uh, and I wanted to highlight it because you know, we are familiar with travel information. We saw examples of it from Steve at the beginning that there was some CDOT elements up there and some uh, RTE elements. But what the users need is all information together in one place. They don't need to be running uh, from one location to another seeking information to try and make their, their travel decisions. What we want to do is have one uh, place where there's information that they can make the decisions on mode, uh, departure time and, and uh, you know, even to uh, deal with a reservation uh, of uh, the, the different segments of the trip. And then um, the performance monitoring part of this is more the, uh, the, the trend related aspects or archive uh, data elements, you know, looking for you know, where, where are things going poorly over time? 
any intention to be able to bring those up. Uh, so it's not not so much the, the real time aspect of uh, as the other two are. And I also should highlight that uh, you know, the, the data sources that we have uh, over there can show that, that uh, we have data that can go through the framework uh, or be um, integrated directly. Uh, we have to, we, we have a lot of uh, systems in the region uh, already, and they, they vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Some are directly integrated uh, the, across jurisdictional boundaries. Others are not yet compatible, and that's something that we need to work on in the data sharing framework to be able to help. But it also allows for the capability of uh, using commercial resources or platforms, uh, third party, um, what some people commonly would call big data. Um, it's a, uh, a lot of the, uh, the concepts can be worked together in the same framework. So that's just what I, what I wanted to cover today. Uh, these conclusions here, just you know, showing that we were working at a, this is a high level concept. We haven't determined you know, who is going to be responsible, uh, how, you know, how much it's going to cost. We're just talking about what, what is it that we need to be able to work together, achieve the goals and objectives that we identify. Uh, the real time data is essential to be able to operate, maintain, uh, a safe and reliable transportation system. And it's got to be collaborative, regional, and integrated uh, in, in approach. And those words come directly from the mobility choice blueprint. And that's you know what I was trying to illustrate with that uh, framework uh, graphic. Uh, and I also highlighted there the, the hybrid aspect of it that there could be uh, data sources and different applications um, uh, that work together. It's not one universal uh, description of how data will be moving and supporting the transportation system. But the one thing that is clear to um, the working group and others so far is the scale and purpose of uh, this is a, at a, a, for the administration and, and a management is at a regional uh, scale. So uh, again, we haven't identified uh, a champion or a way of dealing with that, but we know that the, that's, that's the way it has to be uh, managed to be effective. That is the end of my slide. Brian, did I answer your question from earlier with the, the one yeah, slide? Yeah, I mean, really what I'm looking for is that real, you're talking about improved decision making. Improved right? decision -making. Should that be an objective? That's one. Okay. And then, you know, you talk a lot about current data, right? What about predictive data? So, I want to I want to travel from A to B. Do I leave 15 minutes early? Do I leave 15 minutes late? And I know we can't predict accidents, right? But on a typical day, we probably can, as we're collecting data, determine when that might be and be able to share that information. So yes, that, that was the purpose of my question. Those two things. Good. Thank you. I appreciate that. And you know, you you noted that I missed something that I wanted to say on that slide. Um, for those platforms, a uh, comparison to archive data uh, is going to be beneficial to that. With that in mind, you know, understanding that well, usually it's like this, and today it's like that. Um, and then to you know, looking forward later in the afternoon, based on our archive data, you know, we have uh, you know predictions. So. That is, that was the intention that I missed that part when I was talking about that slide. Thank you. Any other final thoughts or questions on this item? Okay, we'll move on. We're going to jump out a little bit out of order here. Uh, well, our next item will be number seven on your agenda, which is Clean Fleets Enterprise. Robert Spots will be doing the presentation on this one.
Good, good afternoon. I'm Robert Spott, uh, Dr. Cog. I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, Steve McCannon, who's the Mobile Source Program Director at the Colorado Department of Health and Environment. He's going to talk briefly about um, one of the new enterprise tools that was set up as part of Senate Bill 21260. That'll hand it over to <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve McCannon, Robert said, uh, Mobile Source Program Director, CEPAG. Wanted to talk today about uh, the enterprises that were set up. Excellent. Well, I was the acting board administrator for the Clean Fleet Enterprise for about five or six months. So that's kind of why I've covered the material here today. Uh, Senate Bill 21260 created a number of enterprises uh, with the Clean Fleet Enterprise housed at CEPHG. Does everybody know what an enterprise is? <laughs> it's basically a state owned business developed under TAPE where that enterprise collects fees and then reimburses those fees for services or uh, other opportunities to like for the clean fleet enterprise address it to business purpose. So it's to incentivize and support the use of electric motor vehicles and compress natural gas motor vehicles that are fueled by recovered methane. And I read this every time because it's real wordy. <laughs> for businesses and governmental entities that own or operate fleets of motor vehicles including fleets composed of personal motor vehicles owned or leased by individual contractors who provide pre-arranged rides for transportation network companies or deliver goods for a third-party service. So I just want to make sure we're clear on what the business purpose is, and I read it every time, like I mentioned. And we've got about $289 million projected for the next 10 years for this. So this is transformative uh, funding for this effort. I've got an all-star board comprised of a lot of people that everybody knows. Uh, I've got a number of state uh, employees. My boss, Michael Ogletree, 
Kate Kelly, who's here today to talk about clean transit. Maria Eisman, who's with the Energy Office. We've got Carlos Gonzalez, who's with the school district uh, down in El Paso County. Uh, we've got Greg Fulton, who's with the motor carriers. Tim Reeser, who's with Lightning Hybrids or Lightning E Motors now. I've got Uma Seth, who is with Excel, and Will Allison, who is a former uh, air director at APCD, CDPHE, and then John Taylor, who is the Boulder president uh, at the chamber. So our work today, we've met about five times for five board meetings. Meetings are on the fourth Thursday of the month, so our board meeting is this Thursday, if anybody would like to participate. Clean Fleet Enterprise is very easy to find on the, uh, on the web. We were required under Senate Bill 21260 to create a 10 year plan. Now, this 10 year plan was it's like a strategic plan, and we had maybe five months to do this. So, it's going to be pretty broad at this point. Um, we're working on that with uh, FHU, Felsberg, Bolt, Ulevig, great consultant. Uh, we've been stakeholdering for the past three months, it has been intense. Uh, our plan should be due on the street by May 10th for public comment on that plan. We're also monitoring the bipartisan infrastructure law, to see how we can uh, kind of marry up the uh, uh, federal funds with state funding. So our statutory goals of the Clean Fleet Enterprise reduce, reduce health disparities and disproportionately impact communities. That is a huge lens that we're looking through when we look at putting projects out there on the street purchasing vehicles within those communities to clean up fleet yards uh, and a number of other opportunities. Mitigate environmental and health impacts of air pollution. That's going to be key, you know, when we're dealing with the TNCs and retail deliveries. We saw during the pandemic retail deliveries went through the roof. I'm one of those people. I don't go out and shop much, so uh, uh, we need to kind of bring down their emissions uh, when they're delivering uh, all of our goods. We want to help fleets finance electric, hydrogen, and RNG vehicles, that is renewable natural gas through recovered methane. And then we set a fee to finance those efforts, like I mentioned. So we have a number of potential offerings. Uh, these are still going through the 10 year planning process. So we've got electrification of transportation network companies, that will happen. Uh, we've been talking with Uber and Lyft, there are a number of others out there we haven't been able to get a hold of. We'll be doing electric and RNG vehicles for city, county, nonprofit, higher ed, and private companies. We'll be doing bus delivery, shuttle vehicles, all non transit. So, we'll a lot of you working in the transit world. We'll be doing uh, electric transportation refrigeration units. That's the unit in the picture there. Basically, what you have is when you're doing cold food delivery, uh, you can have a trailer pull into a fleet yard with a diesel uh, refrigeration unit that will just sit there and idle for eight, 10 hours in that community. So what this unit allows you to do is plug it into the grid in those communities and reduce those emissions from uh, those diesel units. Usually those diesel units are pretty, pretty old, long in the tube, so they're pretty high emission units. Then we'll be doing clean workforce development efforts as well. So we did have to set a fee as I mentioned, for the Clean Fleet Enterprise. We did that on uh, the 24th of February. Clean Fleet uh, retail delivery fee is going to be five and three cents for retail deliveries. That's specific for the Clean Fleet Enterprise. Then our Clean Fleet per ride fee is three and three quarter cents in a zero emission vehicle, electric, hydrogen, et cetera. And seven and a half cents in a gasoline or diesel. So it's about double for you to take uh, a ride in a diesel or gas. So then I wanted to show everybody kind of what the total fees were. The way it adds up to the retail delivery fee is about 27 cents total for packages, packages to be delivered. That, that, that chart will be placed on top. It's a little more complicated than that. And then we have a 30 cent ride fee for those uh, diesel or gasoline rides. And then a 15 cent fee for anything in a zero emission vehicle. That's what I have on the Phoenix. Any questions? Go ahead, Rep. Steve, great to see you. Great can't to see you. Can't let you off the hook. <laughs> great to see everybody. <laughs> <laughs>
So uh, 200, about estimated $289 million available over the next 10 years. If you did one of those things sort of on the list, like how much of those things could you do with $289 million? And then follow up question is sort of, how is the 10 year plan shaping up? Like what should we expect to see in the draft that gets released um, in a couple of years? So that first question is a very complicated question. Uh, as we try to estimate, I mean, these are gonna be grants. So we take what we get as very well uh, used to in your TIP process. So, you know, where, we're, where we want to focus is in that heavy and medium duty space. And that is going to be a big push for these uh, funds. Now, there are also, there's also a priority where we want to continue working with government fleets in the passenger lighter duty areas. And then a third aspect is going to be electrifying those Amazon uh, style vans that are in their neighborhoods, uh, putting on high BMT. So zero account those emissions. So long story short, we're, I'm not exactly sure, but we're gonna see, especially with our favorite topics, pandemic, the supply chain issues, hearing that the electric vehicle side is not being heavily impacted by this, especially the school bus market, uh, but the diesel side is very heavily impacted, which is probably a good thing. Uh, so with, 10 year plan, what we're anticipating is having the bulk of that money be within kind of the clean vehicle, clean technology space. So we'll have a huge grant offer. You can see probably 90% of the money. We're looking at about 17, 16, 17 million dollars in year one. It's right. 90%, 85% of that money will be in that clean vehicle and technology space. And then we'll have a number of other items such as some workforce development uh, programs that we'll be investigating. We're going to start small, and then there are going to be some planning efforts within that 10 year plan so we can help communities plan for these things, especially those disproportionately impacted communities. So, those are three of the main elements that are going to come out. Thank you. I see. Hi, it's great to hear that you're doing a workforce development plan. Boy, we need to bring people into that field in a hurry. Uh, uh, my question is, I've become a little tiny bit enlightened about things. Uh, at my job, day job at Westminster, we uh, partnered with the Spinner at the Rack to get charging stations. And we really pushed our police department and others to come on, get some more electric vehicles. And they came back and said, it's not the vehicle better than issue, it's the ability to charge and maintain them. Then I listened to a very fascinating RTD presentation about what we'll be able to take them to convert their maintenance facilities to have adequate electric vehicle or other uh, fuel charging facilities. I heard you say a lot about vehicles. I heard you say infrastructure, but I, I wonder, I, I think that's a place we forget. We think about I getting vehicles, we gotta get the vehicles. And what about the support network? Can you say a little bit about that? Yes, Clean Fleet Enterprise will not have funding for that space. And it's gonna be very similar to our CNG efforts of the past. We didn't have a lot of money for these facilities. Space, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's definitely an issue. Ken. So, we have a great assumption that you're successful in getting more electrification and these uh, renewable resources. What about the diesel trucks and that sort of thing that you're hoping to take off? Are you, are you taking those in as you make the grants, or are they going to be back out on the street as a used vehicle? You know, my background has been hard scrappage, cut them up. Uh, there's some, you know, we're investigating that right now because there could be vehicles that don't need to be completely scrapped. Maybe we can uh, turn, you know, there are companies out there that are stripping these vehicles down and just electrifying them from the ground up. So there could be those opportunities. And then you know, there are some programs out there as well that. You know, work with a, so a lot of our big fleets, they don't have a lot of old vehicles, right? They're going to turn their tractor trailers over every three to five years as they come out of warranty. So you know, those fleets, maybe they have a, we, we help them get rid of a vehicle, but they turn one of their vehicles to a fleet that has older vehicles and we 
scrap that overview process and scrap it. It gets a little more complicated, uh, but that's something here we are. All right, Brad. Yeah, quick question. Uh, with IIJA funding, I know there's a couple programs out there that are focused toward municipal fleet that are going to run through the state. Do you know that's coming through your your conduit or through the uh, the energy office? Is this going to be infrastructure? Money? I believe it's both fleet and fleet infrastructure. Uh, the there's school bus money in that, correct? I think it's five five billion comes through that for school bus. Uh, the infrastructure money. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Well, that looks like all the questions we have for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Good to see everybody. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Jacob uh, my and he's going to be doing a presentation at 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Update. Test to see if we're getting better each time. We are. <laughs> we're not there yet, but we're getting better. That's all right. Constant improvement. We're also just at a visiting issues. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate being the uh, test subjects for the board yeah. so that you have it now perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Presenting in front of real life people for the first time in two years. Let's talk about GHG analysis for the 2015 Regional Transportation Plan. So um, we've been talking about this really every month um, at TAC for the past few months. If you recall, last month we talked about what's in the rule um, in terms of the emission reduction targets, and we talked about how the rule defines the baseline for analysis for the 2050 RTP. So what you're seeing on the screen now is sort of that initial analysis that we've done, where we start with um, we start with um, our baseline emissions in the plan. So we've done an analysis of the plan. And remember that the rule defines the baseline as the plan as adopted last April, April 21, and as modeled as adopted. So it's how we modeled the plan at the time of adoption a year ago. So the first row in this table is showing kind of the GHG emissions um, based, on, um, based on the plan as adopted. That's our baseline. And it's showing it for the analysis years um, that we need to do um, the analysis per the GHG rule. The second row in this table is showing the reduction targets required by the rule. And this is what we talked about last month. Again, these are annual amounts of million metric tons by analysis year. And it's confusing, but if you remember, we, I think we got there last month in understanding that you compare by analysis year, you compare the plan as revised, so as the work that we're doing now, against the plan as adopted a year ago. And you do that for each of the four analysis years, 2025, 2030, 2040, 2050, um, in terms of looking at the targets. So we, we have our baseline, so we know what those emissions are. We have the target, the emission reduction targets from the rules, so we know what we need to reduce by. And then the third line from this table is the percent reduction required from the baseline. So now that we know what the baseline is, this tells us the bottom, really the bottom row of this table tells us how far we have to go to meet the emission reduction targets for each analysis here is required by the rule. So before I go any further, I know that's confusing, but in confusing terms, is that clear? Any questions on that? Where are we today? We don't actually model, well, I better ask you, we don't model current conditions. Yeah, we don't, we don't model like today. The, the rule is really based around the plan. Uh, Robert says we're close to the 2025 number. It's only three years away. But okay. So the slide you saw last month, but just a reminder of kind of what we're communicating here. One of the first things we did is we looked at the plan. Remember, it's the plan as adopted as model. And when we modeled the plan a year ago, we focused on things that you can kind of naturally put in a focus model um, in our travel demand model, which is the projects in the plan, the lines, the dots on the maps, the things that, you know, the big, the big ticket uh, projects that make up our 2050 RTP. So last month we talked about the idea that the plan also includes 
a lot of programmatic investments to the tune of $15 billion in the plan. Things that, whether they're set aside, whether they're um, financial plan categories, whether they're just more programmatic in nature, the plan really includes a lot of the things that you're seeing here um, that really help make our transportation system work. So they're not allocated or identified as specific projects at this time over a 30 year plan, but the plan was really intentional in saying that, you know, we want to have these programmatic elements funded uh, to implement over time in our transportation system. So what we talked about last month is, is shown here was the idea that we're trying to get a handle on what are those programmatic investments in the plan. And then we're looking at each of those to kind of understand what's the potential GHG benefit of each of these types of categories. What's, you know, what's fair, and we're being conservative, but what's fair to claim when you say, when you spend a dollar on um, TDM or you spend a dollar on safety and vision zero, how much of that can, can reasonably, conservatively, can you um, sort of take from that as, as a GHG benefit? How much of that dollar, so to speak, will help in reducing GHG emissions? So we calculate, we're still working on these percentages a bit. This is what we showed last month. We're still kind of working this through, but this gives you a rough idea of sort of the percentage for each of these types of programmatic funds that we think are applicable from a GHG emission reduction perspective that we're using in the analysis. All right, so from there, there's going to be a test on this at the end of the presentation. So I want everyone to memorize this. As complicated as it looks, really all this is communicating is that the next step then is we're really just kind of crosswalking the programmatic investments in the plan, the types of categories, the programmatic categories that we have in the plan, which are on the left. To use a cliche, we're thinking about the levers or the dials in the model that we can turn to sort of simulate or surrogates these things that we don't, we can't easily model. We can't code a project up in the plan for some in the model for some of these things, right? So we're trying to understand what can we do in our focused travel demand model to simulate or to capture some of these programmatic elements that we have in the plan. So really, all this is showing is this crosswalk of relationship between the types of investments programmatically that we have in the plan and the types of things that we can influence or change um, or move in the model um, to capture, uh, capture the benefits, capture the implications of these programmatic investments. Another thing we want to look at is, you know, it's not just that we have programmatic investments in the plan. That's great. You know, $15 billion. That's really great. We also have to look at kind of where those fall over the 30 year time period of the plan through 2015. We need to understand sort of that temporal element of that, because again, thinking back to the GHG rule, it's by analysis here for those four analysis years between now and 2050. So we have to understand from a fiscal constraint perspective in the plan, where are these programmatic funds, the time frame in which they're programmed, so that we can kind of start lining up the funding that we think we have available, the GHG benefits associated with that funding, and start to match that up against the emission reduction targets that you saw on the first slide to think about, not just in total how that gets us there, but over, you know, sort of over staging period, over analysis here, um, how these things help us get there. So that's really what this is communicating. So this is actually my last slide for today. I promise much more is coming in future meetings. But for today, really just to summarize, we've been at step one. So we're thinking about those programmatic investments in the plan, how to capture the GHG benefits, how to represent the GHG benefits of those programmatic investments. We're now as a staff in step two, which is we're also thinking about project investments, the investment mix in the plan, the things that we identified in the fiscally constrained plan. What, if any, emission reduction benefits do we get if changing the project mix in the plan, not dramatically, but strategically. For example, if we wanted to advance some bus rapid transit corridors, or if we wanted to test XYZ as a, as a sort of strategic change in the plan, and that's what we're doing now. We're actually doing modeling and analysis on that now to understand what increment of additional reduction benefit does that get us on top of the programmatic work? So that's step two. And then kind of the last step here is, you know, we do all of these things, look at all these strategies, um, and we still need to close a little bit of a gap. We do have the provision in the GHG rule that talks about mitigation measures. We can enter into the mitigation measure process. Um, this is something that CDOT and stakeholders have been working on to define a set of specific mitigation measures um, and GHG emission reduction benefits associated uh, with those measures. We can sort of enter into that process. We can potentially select one or more mitigation measures. Um, something that we'd have to commit to as a region, right? That we're going to implement, you know, this XYZ thing um, and the benefits associated, the, the reduction benefits associated with that to kind of help close that gap. So that's something that we're thinking about, but that's kind of the next step after we do the other things that are outlined here.
Um, so that's pretty short and sweet, um, but wanted to give you that update of the work that we're doing and be happy to answer any questions. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I think this keeps getting more defined, right, Jacob, as we go through it, and from sort of this big to start to put real numbers to. I think one curiosity will be to continue to look at is how, especially two items, right? You're, you were improving operations and we're also trying to reduce speed, right, within different things. And how does that from a simply greenhouse gas come out yeah. in the modeling, right? I guess don't know if, if we really know what that looks like yet. And I think that will be a, a interesting outcome that we're going to see from this. So I don't know if you guys have thought about that much or that's probably where we're going. We have, it is definitely part of the analysis and whether it's that or any of the other things that we listed kind of back, well, even here, um, but any of these things that we're talking about, you know, again, we're trying to be conservative and realistic around how do we define these things? How do we define the emission reduction benefits? How can we be conservative and yet fair about including these things in the analysis? And we're, you know, we haven't done something quite like this before. None of us have. So we're trying to kind of work through and see, you know, step one, step two, where does it get us? Absolutely. Hi, Brian. On table two, could you explain Kind of the percentage of applicability for greenhouse gas in transit investments and BRT and ancillary improvements. Yeah. And there's a big difference in terms of what you see in these percentages. Yeah. Yeah. So let me clarify that a little bit. And we talked about this last month as well. Understand, first of all, we're starting again with, you know, you get here, we, you know, tired of hearing me saying this, but as the plan was modeled for adoption last year. And so this is the additional increment of things that aren't already captured in the model. So understand that there are a lot of things that are captured in our focus model. Um, there's a lot of things that are already included in that baseline analysis. So for example, on the regional BRT, remember in the plan, we defined a regional BRT network with corridors, staged for implementation through the 30 years of the plan. Well, we're able to model those, right? We can code those in the model, we can model them we can understand the benefits and, and the implications of that BRT network. So in that sense, we've already largely captured the BRT investments in the baseline modeling that we did for plan adoption a year ago. So for the ancillary improvements, we're trying to capture that additional increment that's maybe a little bit harder to model, things like access to the stations or other things that kind of help make that BRT network work that aren't so easily modelable. And that's why the percentage here, 5% is low, because we think we've already captured that in the baseline. By the same token, you know, Brian, you asked about transit investments, some of these other things where they weren't so easily modeled or directly modeled the first time around. Now we're trying to capture that additional increment of investment and benefit. That's why some of those numbers are higher. Does that make sense conceptually? So I got some verbal processing here to do, but so bear with me. So on your first table, with the, with the greenhouse gas, the baseline, and where we want to reduce. Where where does this sit within the hierarchy of you know of the energy offices overall reduction, like with EV so many percentage of EV vehicles that are going to be owner occupied or owner owned by the public, et cetera? Because what I'm trying to reconcile here is, is with the tools that we're applying this to, what percentage of that is the overall baseline? benefit or impact to the baseline so that we're not overreaching with this exercise to try to compensate for things that may have already been factored into the bigger construct of how we get to the lower uh, carbon footprint. I think I understand your question. So let me try and venture an answer and um, some colleagues can help me. So there are things, so first of all, in the in the sort of overall roadmap from Senate Bill 260, as we know, it's more than transportation, right? It is very comprehensive in looking at all GHG reductions. So you kind of work from there, you know, from the start, all the other industries and everything. Then you kind of filter down to transportation, then surface transportation, I should clarify. And then the GHG rule is kind of where we're at in terms of multimodal surface transportation, first of all. Within surface transportation, then we're making key assumptions about things that are either in the baseline or in the analysis. So for example, Brooke, you remind me, it was on this slide, but I didn't make the point uh, before when it comes to telework rates, and you see the note on here, the, the rule was anchored in sort of pre-COVID um, for telework rates. And that's why we're showing on the slide that we're using 12% in the baseline. So that leads to the question, well, wait a minute, what about increased teleworking because of COVID? We're capturing that, um, but we're capturing that in the analysis work that we're doing to make sure that it's accounted for. So the bottom line is that some things are built in from the rule and the baseline, 
some things, if they're not in the baseline, we're including the analysis and we put the two together to get the total picture. Um, so I didn't answer your question about EVs, but I wanted to sort of give that concept. I, I think what I, where I was trying to go is that, as you said, there's this hierarchy of all these other things and we're not trying to answer the bigger, we're not gonna solve all of those with these, with these tools. And the question is, is that, are we filtering that back out to really say, this is what this can really reasonably accomplish uh, because this is what we are capable of. This is what the tools that we have available to, instead of trying to compensate for, or not taking into account everything else that's already on the table, that's to help to achieve the overall goal. That's kind of what, that was my first yeah, question. She, so she was, was really second. meant to, to bracket that set of expectations yeah. to the things that, that we're trying to deal with here. So that follows with my second question as Dr. Cog MPO is based on this exercise from a policy standpoint, is there gonna be low hanging fruit or high yield that are gonna potentially outcomes of this that are potentially change policy direction when we look at multimodal transportation improvements in terms of where money should go to focus on? Because I, I can see that being a, a natural conclusion. Yeah, well, let me answer it this way because it's a good question. There are, I don't know if there's any low hanging fruit here, but there are some things that- Hi, Well, I'm saying, let me put it this way. Yeah. That some of these programs will generate a higher yield of carbon reduction, greenhouse we're, gas reduction. Yeah, we're definitely finding through the analysis, we're testing so many different things, right? That we've covered today and coming back to things like this, right? Yeah. So we're finding that some things, I'll use telework as an example. If you just want a silver bullet strategy, telework is it. Telework by itself is not gonna get us all the way there. So I don't wanna oversell that. But if you, if you said, Jacob, what's the bang for the buck? It's telework, right? That is one sort of low hanging fruit, so to speak. What we're finding is that as we go through this, it's gonna take a collection of different things. Things like telework, things like the programmatic strategies, other things that we're starting to test now. So there's no, and I wanna be clear about this, there's no one or two things that are gonna get us there. There are things that give us a good start and we're trying to figure out the things that will help us get to the finish line. Does that get you to what you're getting at, Brooke? I think, Lauren, go to your next slide, the, the brief, this one. So the question is, is that when you look at these, does any of this change how Dr. Cog would look at evaluating future TIP applications as they would potentially say, this is where we get our biggest yield of greenhouse gas reduction and taking that to the policy makers sort of as part of the matrix of overall decision making. Yeah, here's what I'll say. At the end of the day, when we're done with this work, I'll come to this slide. After we've gone through all these steps and we've done all the work, um, and we've, we've revised the 2050 RTP because that's a requirement. We have to revise the plan back to refer that includes the changes that we're making. And those changes can be everything that we've talked about today and more. Spending more money on programmatic elements, um, things about telework, things, changing the project mix in the plan. Maybe we have to do a mitigation measure or two. Whatever it is, those things that were in the plan, we want to be honest with the region and pretty intentional that says, if these are the if these are the, the sets of things, you know, the several things that we think is going to make this work from a GHG perspective, then we need to honor that. If it's spending more money, for example, on programmatic things, then you know that needs to come back around in our tip process. Or if, for example, we do go with the mitigation measure um, and that becomes part of our strategy, then we need to be honest with ourselves as a region and say, okay, we need to do this thing to help us get there. So the short answer is yes, Brooke, that whatever we put in the plan at the end of the day to help us meet the GHG rule, we need to be honest as a region and actually do those things going forward. Whether that shows up in TIP funding, policies that we adopt as part of the RTP, revised RTP, other things that we do, we need to carry that forward. Thank you, appreciate that. Based on your analysis over there, is it attainable? Ask me next month. <laughs> I mean, look, we're, we're getting closer. We have not gotten there yet. We're, we're getting there. Um, but that's part of, and again, it's a multi-layered, I hope, as confusing as this all is, I hope that's one thing you've gotten from this, that we're really trying different sets of things. And so sort of like that Rubik's Cube, we're trying to find the exact right combination to get there. So still a work in progress. So I don't really want to characterize, is it attainable? Not yet. We're getting there. It's not easy. We're trying to figure out how hard it's going to be. That's probably the most honest answer I can give. I'll, I'll let Jacob off the hook and just I'll give y'all a, a kind of a preview. We, we don't think that through step two, through sort of modifications to the plan that we can fully get there. So be prepared, we might have to talk about a couple of mitigation strategies to try to close that final gap to achieve the targets. So that kind of based on what we know now, what we think we 
know now, that's probably likely where we end up. But as Jacob said, we're still doing a lot of technical work to, to kind of figure this out and, and do the analysis in the right way. Oh, uh, in the event that we end up in that situation where you described, where does the funding for the mitigation measures come from? We don't know. To kind of piggyback on Alex's question, we end up in the mitigation. If I understand, we can probably look at the regionally significant mitigation measures. Um, if that's the case, if you look at that, what type of paperwork is that to put on the reporting on the locals to keep track of that? I guess it would be another question that it would come up. Because there's a resource that has to track that. I think depending on the mitigation measures, and again, that we were very intentional with this language, we can consider the mitigation action plan process. The policy alternative for the board to think about is we just accept the restriction on the funds um, as exists in the rule as the Transportation Commission adopted it and restrict our use of, of um, uh, CMAC funds and STPG funds. So that, that is an alternative to going the mitigation plan, action plan process. Um, the, the responsibility for reporting, if, if Dr. Cox uh, decided ultimately if we needed to and decided to go with the mitigation action plan process, Dr. Cog is the one that adopts the plan and adopts the mitigation action plan process and is then responsible for the annual reporting to CDOT and the Transportation Commission on the, on the mitigation action plan process. It does not fall to the individual jurisdictions, although depending on what the mitigation uh, strategies are that might go into that action plan, we would be requesting some data from our local, some information from our local partners, assuming that there might be some local role in helping us uh, demonstrate that we're actually implementing those um, mitigation strategies. I, I, mean, I see that it's similar to the RTOT plan where the signals you're getting, well, you, you report that you, you work together, you're still taking a lot of input from the upper uh, staff to, to help your, your staff reach those conclusions. That's all for today. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you. All right, our next item. Uh, let's see here. We are on item number eight, which is clean transit enterprise. Rob. Oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually just introducing. Okay, your Kelly, you okay here? Oh, okay. I just get to hand off to someone that actually knows what they're talking about. Oh, delegation. <laughs> Um, for those who I haven't met before, I'm Kay Kelly. I'm the Chief of Innovative Mobility at CDOT. Um, so my group has uh, four divisions. Um, one is around connected and automated vehicles. One is on uh, transportation demand management. Um, and then I have the Division of Transit and Rail and Electrification, which are the two branches most closely in involved in the clean transit enterprise, which I'm here to talk to you about today. And my voice does not carry very well. I'm one of those people, so if you can't hear, just wave at me. <laughs> um, so um, as, uh, as I'm sure you know, uh, SB 260 created uh, several new trans, uh, several new enterprises. Um, among those were three of them specifically focused on electrification of transportation. Um, so we heard from, uh, from Steve about the Clean Fleet Enterprise in CDPHE. There's also a community access enterprise focused on charging, which is housed at the Energy Office. And then the Clean Transit Enterprise is housed at CDOT and it's focused on electrification of uh, transit. And we do have $134 million over the first 10 years of the enterprise. Uh, we have a nine member board. Um, six of the members are appointed by the governor and three of them are state agency staff. Um, so our chair is uh, Matt Fromer uh, with SWEEP. 
um, and uh, Vice Chair is David Averill um, from uh, the Transit Agency on the Western Slope. Um, but I feel like this is a, a really interesting board. I'm always amazed when we get together. There's a lot of great perspective um, in terms of uh, fleets, in terms of transit fleets specifically, technology. Um, so uh, really uh, glad that all these folks have chosen to spend some time with us as we've been working over the last several months. The board started meeting in January for the first time. Uh, so we've had four monthly meetings so far um, and the board's just really been great in helping us think through all the things that we need to do in order to stand up the enterprise um, and get things moving. Um, so our business purpose um, is to reduce and mitigate the adverse environmental and health impacts of air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions produced by retail deliveries. And we have four ways in which we do that. Um, when Steve was talking about his enterprise, he mentioned the retail delivery fee and the transportation network company per ride fee. Um, the clean transit enterprise is funded only by the retail delivery fee um, and our fee is set at three cents. Um, so, but we can use the revenue generated by that uh, fee in order to do four things. Uh, first of all, replacing existing gasoline and diesel transit vehicles with electric vehicles. Um, and that does include um, uh, hydrogen as well as renewable natural gas. Um, secondly, we can provide the associated recharging infrastructure for those vehicles. Uh, we can support facility modifications that allow for the safe maintenance and operations of the vehicles. And we can also fund planning studies to help transits make this transition because um, all the research out there suggests that fleets who are transitioning to a new technology like electrification are most successful when they have a solid plan in place. Um, you can't just go out and say, hey, I'd like one of those and have it delivered to plug it in and expect everything to go great, right? Uh, we want to make sure that we're helping agencies plan on the front end so that they can be successful when they ultimately deploy the vehicles. Um, so in terms of our, our powers and duties, uh, really the first thing on our plate was uh, 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 promulgating a rule to impose the clean transit retail delivery fee um, and also to govern the process by which we award and oversee grants. So we uh, completed that at our April meeting. Um, again, the fee was set at three cents um, for retail deliveries. Um, and the next thing on our to-do list is by June 1st, we need to publish a 10-year plan that details how we're going to execute our business purpose and um, how we're going to spend that fee revenue for the first 10 years. Um, this is very much a, a working document. Um, you know, we had very little time to develop uh, the plan, so we're going to get it as close as we can. Um, we are able to edit it and revise it as circumstances change. Um, and then uh, we do have a requirement in statute that it needs to be updated at least every 10 years. Um, we plan on updating it sooner than 10 years. Um, once we have those two things in place, uh, revenue will start flowing from uh, the Department of Revenue on July 1st. It will reach CDOT sometime this fall. Um, and at that point, we are able to issue grants, loans, rebates, and revenue bonds. Um, I will say that transit agencies are most comfortable with grants. Um, we're still trying to figure out how things like grants, or sorry, how loans, rebates, and revenue bonds work in this context. So again, as we're developing the 10-year plan, um, we're focusing primarily on what we know right now um, and if other if some of these other strategies show promise um, and fit into the context of how transit agencies operate financially, um, we have the ability to add them later on um, as we kind of get more information and details on how that would work. Um, we also have a requirement to create, maintain, and regularly update a public accountability dashboard that shows the public um, how we're spending our, our funding and the status of all the projects that we fund. Um, and then we do uh, need to prepare an annual report um, on our activities to the Transportation Commission and the House and Senate Transportation Committees. Um, so one thing checked off the list, many more things left on our to-do list. Um, the 10-year plan has been our primary focus for the last couple of months. Um, the uh, SB 260 said we shall have a 10-year plan, and it didn't really provide any additional detail on what would be contained therein. Um, so uh, this is an outline of what we are intending to include in our 10-year plan. Uh, you know, some basic introductory stuff about SB 260 and the transit, ZEV, uh, transit zero emission goals for the state. Um, the anticipated fee revenues, that was all projected when SB 260 was, uh, was passed. 
Um, the third element there is transit electrification barriers and opportunities. Um, transit agencies have been working really hard toward um, the zero emission roadmap for quite a while now. We did publish the transit um, ZEV roadmap in, I believe it was January of this year. Um, so the transit agencies have been kind of convening on this topic and that report identified a lot of the, the barriers and the opportunities and what the fleet currently looks like and what it would take um, in terms of investments to turn over the fleet in certain time periods. Um, so, um, so a lot of that is already written, thankfully. Um, so what our primary focus has been on in terms of our stakeholder conversations um, and working with the board has really been these funding strategy questions. Uh, you know, we're authorized to do grants, loans, rebates, and revenue bonds. What do we want to focus on in the beginning? Um, you know, is there a certain type of project that we want to prioritize at the beginning? Um, what kind of match levels, scrappage requirements? You're talking about scrappage under clean fleets. That's been a very active conversation in the transit world as well. Um, replacement ratios. A lot of transit agencies are telling us that um, in some, in many cases, it takes more like one and a half zero emission buses to replace the route of one diesel bus. So, you know, if we have a one to one replacement ratio, um, it might work okay in the beginning, but years out, uh, we might run into some challenges where they don't actually have the vehicles they need to meet their routes. So, um, so those are the questions that we've been holding with the board and with our stakeholders. Um, and again, we have until June 1st to publish uh, this plan on our website. Um, so if you're interested in getting engaged in the conversation, um, we've been meeting with stakeholders since about mid-March on this. Uh, there's quite a few opportunities coming up. Uh, we have uh, the transit agencies have a monthly meetings. We've been discussing this with them at their last two monthly meetings. Uh, the Transit and Rail Advisory Committee at CDOT is on our list. Um, the Colorado Electric Vehicle Coalition, uh, that's the CEBC, they have a transit subgroup that's been very active in these conversations with us. We've been working with um, CASTA, the Colorado, Colorado Association of Transit Agencies. Um, and then, of course, um, having conversations just at our regular board meetings as well. So we do have a specific working session dedicated to the 10-year plan on the calendar with the board for May 11th um, that everyone is welcome to attend and participate in. Um, and we do expect that the board will be voting on the 10-year plan at their meeting on May 25th. Um, and then we'll, again, get that posted uh, by our June 1st deadline. And if you're interested in more information, we have a website. Um, and if you just Google C dot uh, clean transit enterprise, it'll be the first thing that pops up, but um, you can subscribe to this website. So if you're interested in kind of getting periodic updates of what's going on and not having to go out proactively and look at our website on a regular basis, you can sign up for updates um, and we'll send you notifications when we're having meetings um, or, or any other materials posted to the website that could be of interest. And that's all that I have. Thanks for having me here today. All right, any questions? Ron? I get, I get everybody warmed up. <laughs> hey, thank you. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, so with Steve's presentation on the clean fleet enterprise and yours on the clean transit enterprise, would I be safe in saying that the clean transit enterprise is focused on public transit service providers? And so, um, you know, there are areas that contract with a private provider like VIA, transportation provide transit services, but it's a but it's through a contract. So VIA might compete for funding through the clean fleet enterprise and would not be eligible to compete for the clean transit enterprise, but the transit, but the transit agency that might contract with VIA for certain services would be eligible to compete for the train for the clean transit enterprise for sort of their own transit services, their own public fleet. Is that, yeah. am I understanding that so correctly? So the eligible entities for the clean transit enterprise are transit fleets. So if you are currently receiving funding, FTA funding as a pass-through through CDOT, um, you're eligible. Or if you're getting money directly from the FTA, um, you know, because you're a large enough agency, for instance, RTD, you'd be eligible. Um, I often get the question about why clean transit and clean fleet are separate, and really it's because of the entanglement of FTA funding. Um, so fleets are generally with Steve, unless they are a transit fleet, in which case they're with us because we deal with the FTA element. Debra. So. Hey, hey. I asked Steve the same question I'm going to ask you, and that is, uh, 
this focused on vehicles versus the infrastructure to charge vehicles. Um, so we have four elements of projects that we can fund vehicles, infrastructure, facilities, and planning. Um, and everything so far, all the discussions with the board are that we are open to all four of those types of projects. Um, when we put out our first round of funding, we're not sure kind of who is going to apply for what. We kind of intuitively think a lot of agencies are going to ask for planning funding in the first few rounds. And then once they have that planning funding, we'll start to see more applications for vehicles and infrastructure once the transit agencies have a better handle on kind of what that path forward looks like. Um, but we really don't know. And I think at this point, the board wants to keep it wide open and not say, you know, 100% of our funds are going to this one of our four categories. <laughs> um, we're going to try to have oh, as open as eligibility as we can to ensure that we understand the mix as we're getting things up and doing. Thank you. I hope that there's conversations happening with the transit agencies to encourage um, and incent them to be ready to apply. I, I get worried sometimes when I talk to my colleague that, well, what do you mean you're not wrapped up for this? So I will try to remember my conversations to bug my colleagues. And so we did, um, through the Office of Innovative Mobility, we added a category to the um, to the department, the Division of Transit and Rail Super Call, where they eventually actually ask all the transit agencies to apply for all the different types of funding at one time. Um, and we put out our first round of transit planning grants this year. Um, we have four agencies apply. Again, this was before the Clean Transit Enterprise existed and could fund these things. Um, and we had four agencies from across the state apply for planning funding. So um, we're, we're trying to get the word out there, start planning ahead. It's here, you can take advantage of the funds. So. Okay, one last question. So uh, as an enterprise, you have bonding authority built in as an enterprise. Can you can you only bond the, the Senate Bill 260 fee revenue that you have, or can you partner with a transit agency that has some ongoing revenue, but not enough maybe to um, acquire a number of fleet vehicles up front? Could you be the bonding agent for them through agreement with the transit agency to sort of leverage some of their ongoing money in order to purchase some um, electric uh, buses? We have the authority to issue revenue bonds. Um, I will say that we have not been super focused on the mechanics of that at this point, um, given our, our timeline. Um, I don't believe we will have any revenue bonds in our first round of funding, but it's something that we'll have a conversation about, you know, where are the scenarios where that would be really helpful to a transit agency. We do have that authority. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. One more informational item. Ah, there <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this uh, is item number nine on your agenda, non-attainment area enterprise. Ron, you get to introduce this one too? I do. Uh, so I get the, I have the pleasure of introducing Darius Papaz from CDOT. Um, and I will use, take this opportunity real quickly, Darius, to also um, congratulate you on your recent appointment as the deputy director of the Division of Transportation Development uh, at, at CDOT. Um, Darius is um, helping out Rebecca who couldn't be here today and had a conflict. So Darius, take it away and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, kind welcome. Um, as Ron said, my name is Darius Parklaws. I am the Deputy Director for the Division of Transportation Development at CDOT. And going to give you a quick overview of the non-attainment area, non-attainment area pollution mitigation enterprise. Uh, next slide. So um, as with all of these enterprises, these were established in with Senate Bill 260 last year. Um, we all have a business purpose um, for this particular enterprise. The business purpose is mitigating the environmental impact and health impacts of air pollution from the rapid growth of retail deliveries and pre-arranged rides. Um, and that includes by funding projects that reduce traffic congestion, um, demand management uh, projects, and alternatives to driving alone, and uh, projects that directly reduce air pollution. So um, we have uh, 
set up the enterprise within the last few months. Um, we do have the board, we have met three times since the beginning of January. So this is our board composition. Uh, Kristen Stevens is the chair from Fort Collins. Uh, Lynn Baca from Brighton is our vice chair. Um, Jessica Holguin from Denver is uh, serves as a representative of the disproportionately impacted communities, um, as is Leanne Wheeler from Aurora. Uh, Stacy Saniga is uh, from Greeley, serves as an ind individual with expertise in environmental, environmental justice, and public health issues. And uh, Shoshana Lu, executive director of CDOT, um, serves on the board, as does Dina Walchak from uh, CDPAG. So some of the powers and duties, um, this slide uh, should seem familiar. We have some of the similar powers and duties as the other enterprises. So uh, we have uh, a air pollution mitigation for ride fee, so that's for ride sharing. And we also have an air pollution mitigation for retail delivery fee, which we'll get into in a little bit. And then we were to inform the Department of Revenue by March 15th of each year what those fee records, will, what the fee levels will be, so that way they can be imposed in the next fiscal year, and that will start on July 1. And as with the other enterprises, we have to do a 10-year plan, which will kind of outline how we execute our business purpose and estimate the amount of funding we'll have over the next 10 years and how we'll allocate that. And so, and then we have a couple of other things within statute that we'll work on throughout fiscal year 23, especially after we um, identified areas for uh, potential funding, which includes uh, having a public, dashboard, a public accountability dashboard. And then we have an annual report as well that we present both to the Transportation Commission as well as the House and Senate Transportation Committees. So, um, in the rulemaking, um, it's all within, you can see the statute on the board there, uh, the uh, maximum fee that was allowable to be established by the board is 11 and a quarter cents for each prearranged ride that is a car share or is in a zero emission vehicle. Any other prearranged ride is 22 and one half cents. Uh, 22 and one half cents. And then per retail delivery, uh, seven tenths of one cent. So, um, our rules um, establishing these fees were uh, adopted by the board on April 14th, so they are in effect. Uh, we did clarify the, the piece that's in uh, red here for the car share piece, um, that it is 11 and one fourth cent, not 22 and a half cent in our rules, and then it sets up some other pieces in there, so the uh, regulatory pieces in there for the enterprise to do business. So um, from there, uh, from these, uh, the reason why we have these fees and the reason they were set out because the legislature wants to help mitigate the impact of the growth of our of retail deliveries and from uh, uh, pre-arranged rides. And so we will fund projects that will help reduce the uh, air pollution and environmental impacts in the non-attainment areas of Colorado. So funding over the next um, next 10 years. So um, going back to the, the fee levels, 11 and a half cents for zero emission vehicle ride share and for car share, 22 and one half cents for every other right, uh, pre-arranged ride share and uh, seven tenths of one cent for retail delivery. So we're looking at in the first year about 7.1 million and over the entire 10 years for the enterprise about 184 million dollars. So it starts out at seven and kind of ramps up from there. Um, within our statutory requirements, we talked about the 10-year plan and so the enterprises talked about the 10-year plan for each enterprise, um, accountability dashboard, annual report, and, and looking at public engagement as well, uh, which we'll be diving into with the board and with stakeholder groups uh, throughout the month. Throughout the month of May, I was going to say March, but it's May. You know. Um, for our 10-year plan, some of the uh, some of the similar uh, concepts that we've seen from the other boards laying out our board purpose, the, uh, the enterprises uh, business purpose, composition of the board, the anticipated fee revenues, and we're looking at what our funding focus should be over the next 10 years. Um, looking at public outreach, if there's any requirements for projects, and then we'll also be discussing group new dates by the board as well. And as Kay had mentioned, this, we, we're looking at this at the, at the 35,000 foot level, so um, making this a living document. The statute does not require us to do any modifications to the plan until 2032, but of course we would want to um, expand on that as 
starts to build more information and the enterprise starts getting going on its business. Um, so within the funding focus area, which is a discussion topic that the, within the 10 year plan of, of what the funding focus area should be and all the specifics, that is something we're going to take up the board at our next meeting. Um, the, we, uh, the projects must be in the non attainment areas, and right now that includes Dr. Cobb, North Front Range, and most of the Upper Front Range TPR area. I think there's a northern portion of Blairford County that's not in uh, ozone non attainment. And we're looking at uh, funding focus areas at a very high level right now, mitigating, mitigating environmental and health impacts uh, from transportation, reducing traffic congestion, and improving network uh, neighborhood connectivity. So we want to take those into account as we're developing this 10-year plan and looking at uh, the overall strategic direction that, that the enterprise is going to take. And so for our public outreach, um, we have a a number of options that we're going to take. We did have open comment for the rule period that has closed and uh, we have incorporated those comments into the rule as um, as shown previously. Uh, we did have updated the website. Um, Kay showed that there is a, an update portion, uh, uh, kind of like a subscription portion to the website where you can get email updates on what the enterprise is doing. Uh, that is up there as well. Um, we're looking at uh, developing public outreach survey that uh, we'll share with our partners to distribute out in order to solicit feedback with limited time that we have in order to reach the maximum amount of people as uh, maximum amount of people as possible. Um, also looking at a public outreach meeting meeting and forum type that we're looking at in May of holding that, and of course we'll uh, we'll uh, broadcast that out uh, once we have the details down over the next week or so. Also having an uh, having a, a informational video on the enterprise and the, uh, the implications of it and what we're going to do, and then coming back with some of our current uh, stakeholder committees. Um, uh, with, uh, perhaps this committee, working with North Park Range, looking at going to the statewide transportation advisory committee. So um, that's our, our our plan of activities for public outreach over the next month, and of course we'll continue public outreach throughout the life of the 10 year plan, um, especially as we're looking at where this, uh, where the dollars are going to go specifically on what projects. Um, so future meetings, um, May 5th is our next meeting, which we're going to primarily focus on the 10 year on the enterprises 10 year plan and the specifics within it. That'll be at 3 p.m. on May 26th. We're looking at finalizing the enterprise 10 year plan and have that have that adopted by the board. And that should be a few days ahead of our statutory deadline of having the 10 year plan published. And then the next meeting afterwards is on June 26th. Um, and to get more information and resources, um, it's within uh, the CDOT's website for the enterprise. The enterprise's website is within CDOT's. Um, if you go to CDOT's website, uh, coeot.gov, search on a team and enterprise, it should pop up for you. Um, we also have a um, email address, which there's a link on the website too, that will send uh, that will send updates to the appropriate staff. So uh, with that, I'm thank you for your time today and open to any questions. Questions. I don't see any. Oh, we got Alex on there. Go ahead. <laughs> in terms of distributing the funding, is that going to be done through a competitive call for projects, or how does that work? Yeah, that's still that's still in the works right now. We're uh, that's probably going to be one of the topics that we're going to discuss with the board on May fifth, and then throughout the application process as how the funds will be distributed. Is there going to be a, is there what what is the process for that and then as we have an overall outline of the process we can get into specific especially as we get closer to when we actually have the funds and are able to distribute them i guess kind of a related question is somewhere in there is development of some kind of evaluation criteria that sort of thing for scoring evaluating projects yeah we if if that if that is in, if if that if the board wants to include that as part of the criteria to award money to projects, uh, we will have that and we will make that available as well. Do you see on the distribution projects if you may not have this list yet, but since you're covering several different NPOs uh, along the front range, do you see that divided by population of those NPOs? Or do you see this more uh, uh, 
free for all for, for whoever is getting the Medicare coverage. Excellent question. Um, that is again something that we're planning on bringing to the board on on May uh, May fifth to see how they want to distribute it between the, the three geographic areas that are in non-attainment. Um, to see whether it's population based, uh, whether or on the uh, opposite end, whether it's a free for all. So those are those are still in the works. Uh, we haven't nailed that down yet, but that is a discussion on May fifth. I said it quick, but it looks like we all have a lot of reading on June 1st. Probably. <laughs> so I think just as we're getting these out, right, with all of these great programs kind of coming out together, right, how that is something that is kind of tied together or, you know, like the funding questions, right, there's just so many pieces that are being worked on, but I, I don't know if there's how those are kind of getting combined together for us to be able to explain outside of, you know, our groups to our jurisdictions and to the others. I think that's something that the board and others may be curious about as we get all these together and start to put them together. How does that kind of have a flow chart or something together? Because it's confusing. Darius, thank, thanks again. Uh, I will say one of the best acronyms ever is kind of tired middle afternoon on a Monday, DAPI. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, seriously, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, first of all, for all of you, we wanted to bring these enterprises to the tax. But, while the 10-year plans were being developed and before the 10-year plans were adopted by the boards. So you all had a heads up to go pay attention, right? And because we should be provide, we should be providing feedback to the enterprises as they develop their 10-year plans. Because particularly on this one, really important considerations, right? Because this is the only enterprise that has a geographic limitation associated yep. with it. And um, you know, Dr. the Dr. Cog MPO area is one of those one of those restrictions. So one of my feedbacks to you, Darius, might be, you know, in terms of thinking about how to allocate these funds among the, the eligible geographic area might be related to our relative share of the greenhouse gas reduction targets adopted by the Transportation Commission and the greenhouse gas rule, right? And so if, we're bear, if we bear a, a disproportionate amount uh, or a certain amount of reduction that we have to achieve in this region, relative to the other reduction targets, maybe that's an indicator of how much of the money should be should be allocated within within the various regions where this money is eligible to be spent. I would also suggest that I would I would hope that the board of the enterprise isn't just sort of um, solely allocating the funds to certain projects, that there ought to be some open sort of process for selecting projects. And even if it's not an open grant process, I think to Alex's point, there ought to be some pretty clear and transparent criteria or evaluation to justify why this investment and not this investment, right? Or, you know, and, and so that everyone can understand how those decisions were made. Perfect. Thank you. I'll take that back. I guess on another uh, to feedback on what Ron said is um, point of destination uh, revenue. So whichever APO that the delivery uh, ends in is where the revenue goes to. So whatever the NPO area of Dr. Cog is, that service area, the, the, the revenue that's collected within that service area stays in that service area. I'll take a look at that. That one is that one I am not sure of of the that that may be a question for the Department of Revenue. But so we'll you look. can municipalities do this all the time with, with online sales. Is you know the, the folks it's point of service. It's just it's just like you pay sales tax when you have your appliance delivered to your house. It's a similar prospect, it's an easy thing to do. It just it's another geo code that needs to be added from the Department of Revenue, but it would be an equitable way to ensure that where the where the impact is happening. Is that the revenue is going to that place and it speaks to your equity and takes the politics out of it because it's just point of service. But. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, just sort of a reminder to TEC. So we want to present on all of the four. Um, enterprises that were created by Senate Bill 260. We've done three of them today. The fourth one was the Community Access Enterprise. And just a reminder, we presented on that back at the February TAC meeting. So now if you're kind of in enterprise mode after today and you want to go back and look, um, you'll find those materials in our February TAC packet. Okay. 
Thank you very much. All right, we're on to administrative items. Uh, there's an item here of AMP working group update. Hey, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm the appointed person to AMP for the TAC. Um, funny story, I was appointed as an AMP person at our last in person meeting, so I've never given this. I'm just going to say, see, it's very, very good. Uh, the AMP working group met earlier this month and heard informational briefings from the Colorado Smart Cities Alliance about their School of Mines AV rover pilot. Uh, and from Dr. Cog and Ride report about their work on our regional shared micromobility data collaborative. The working group also discussed a draft uh, of a technology tracking spreadsheet uh, tool developed to track track tech related pilots in the Denver region. Uh, this, this spreadsheet will be hosted on the AMP website once it's agreed upon by all the partners. Um, the group also discussed the concept of a white paper for mobility data sharing in the concept in the context of regional mobility data platform. Uh, and finally, as Greg said earlier, we heard an update about the RTO and DH strategic plan. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Jessica, do you have a I do, yes. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to Dr. Cog. I have some uh, virtual colleagues who are saying the technology is working phenomenally. They can hear and see very well. So thank you for your investment in technology. Um, so CDOT, the Freight Safety and Mobility Branch, has announced their National Highway Freight Program, so some more funding, um, for the fiscal years 22 and 23, and the call for projects is open, um, call for ideas until May 30th. So this is our freight program, so CDOT would be curious if you have ideas, we're looking for things that are on our system. Um, and so we're generating our ideas internally as well, but we wanted to bring that opportunity to you. Um, it's a two-year call for projects with an allocation of $20.2 million. And some, I, some things we've funded, at least in Region 1 previously, the Vasquez Boulevard, uh, climbing lanes on I-70, chain up stations, uh, runaway truck ramps, and things kind of of those nature. Um, if you have ideas, you can send them to Joanne Matson. Um, with CDOT, and that's J O A N N dot M A T S O N at state dot C O dot U S. Thank you. Anyone else have anything they'd like to discuss? Ron? I will just say uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, uh, thank you for um, participating in this meeting in person. Um, we, we felt it was really important um, to reconvene TAC in person. Um, we are being surgical and strategic about what meetings we ask people to participate in person with. So a lot of our, a lot of our committees, a lot of our working groups, we will continue to have um, virtual options for full participation or fully remote meetings because we, we also want to do our part to contribute to reducing travel. But when, when we have really deliberative bodies like this, uh, where you're making really important decisions together, Yes, we managed through two years of virtual meetings and doing that virtually, um, but from our perspective, uh, we feel like when we, when we felt like it was safe to reconvene in person, um, uh, I believe that the value of this in-person, face-to-face interaction and engagement and discussion around these really important topics, I felt a different vibe today. I don't know about the rest of you. I felt a different vibe in terms of level of engagement and participation and discussion, um, and which is why we wanted to have this committee and why we will have regional transportation committee in person is once a month. We appreciate and I understand that it can be a challenge to, to travel from downtown for these meetings, but I hope we're striking the right balance. And I just really appreciate you being here today. Thanks, Ron. All right. Uh, our next meeting will be right here in person on May 23rd, 2022. Have a great month.